happy day people uh, i am shriniti from department of commerce anf shift 1 I'll be taking a topic from legal systems of business uh, under Indian Contract Act of 1872. We'll be seeing a topic on capacity of people, persons to contract. So now, before before going to the topic, so what is a contract? A contract is an agreement. An agreement which is legally enforceable by law becomes a contract. So now, what is an agreement then? Agreement is going to be an offer. If an offer is made by a person. and that intended person accepts the offer at the face of it becomes an agreement so our agreement is nothing but offer plus acceptance whereas contract is agreement plus legal enforceability becomes an contract okay so now next before moving on to the topic we'll i'll also give a brief introduction about what are the essential elements of a contract so in order for a contract to be valid and legally enforceable these essential elements are mandatorily required so first one is going to be an offer and acceptance as i mentioned earlier an offer a person makes an offer to that in, to a person or a public at large and that intended person when they accept it it becomes an agreement and when it becomes legally enforceable it becomes a contract so now so that's the first essential element second essential element is going to be it should be an with an intention to create a legal relationship uh, a contract should be entered by both the parties to create a legal obligation but not a social obligation that is for example a social obligation when a person is going to invite another person for having a dinner or lunch or from family function and the other person accepts it if he doesn't turn up for the function the person cannot go and sue so likewise the intention of a contract should be to create a legal relationship next it should be for a lawful consideration consideration is nothing but a uh, quid pro quo that is something in return say for example i am i am making an offer to some mr x that i'll be selling my pen to you for rupees 10 so in this case and if mr x accepts it the consideration for me is going to be rupees 10 rupees whereas for that of mr x is going to be the pen okay so that's going to be a consideration so this consideration should be lawful it shouldn't be illegal it shouldn't be some illegal substances okay so now next it should be a free and genuine consent when i'm making an offer to a person that person should be accepting it out of his own will and wish it shouldn't be based on some kind of a uh, undue pressure or an influence or an external uh, misrepresentation of facts or any of these things could would not amount to a valid contract it would result in a invalid or the contract would turn void okay so now next next essential element will be a lawful object the objective objective or the purpose for which the contract was initiated should be lawful it shouldn't be illegal or against public policy okay the perp when the purpose is lawful only it's a valid contract otherwise it's a void contract agreement not declared void agreement not declared void is going to be where uh, if a person is entering into an agreement for the purpose of uh, carrying out illegal activities or some other activity which is going to be against the public policy are going to be termed as void so any other any contract should not be already termed as a void agreement next certainty and possibility of performance any contract should be certain and specific that is if i'm going to hold five pens in my hands and i'm going to tell mr x that i will sell my pen to you for 10 rupees so the these five pens are of different categories so mr x is accepting it but then he might have assumed it to be a different pen for 10 rupees and i might be intending to sell a different pen so it should be specific telling that this red pen i am willing to sell this red pen to you for rupees 10 that is how it should be so it should be certain specific and it should be possible to perform that is if i'm going to go and tell mr x that i will uh, making an offer to mr x that i will bring you moons or star to you and if mr x accept is that possible to perform no i won't be able to bring the moon or stars so it should be possible to perform the contract next legal formalities certain contracts most of the cases are uh, word of mouth or the written agreement both are valid as per the contract but then certain contracts require certain legal formalities that is a certain paper works are to be followed a proper revenue stamp should be pasted in case of certain contracts and a and proper authorization or a witness signature should be there so all these legal formalities are to be adhered to 
in order to enforce it in the hands of law. Suppose in future, if the other party is not performing their promise, in order to sue that person, proper legal formality should be followed in order to sue that person. Okay, so now coming to our topic, our one of the essential elements of our topic is capacity to contract. So capacity, contra capacity to contract is a, one of the essential elements of a contract. So now capacity to contract is nothing but the parties entering into the contract should be the competent parties. Only when an agreement is entered into by competent parties, it becomes a contract. That is only then it is legally enforceable. So according to section 11, who is being termed as competent persons are any person who has attained the majority of age, uh, any person who is of sound mind, and any person who is not disqualified by contract, disqualified for contract by law. Okay, so all these three persons are competent persons. In, in general, that is to be precise, any person who is a minor, minor of age, uh, who is of unsound mind, and a person disqualified by law, becomes incompetent persons and any contract that is being entered with these people is going to be void ab initio which means void from the beginning okay so we'll look into in detail about these three persons minors who are going to be termed as minors so as per section 3 of indian majority act 1875 any person who attains the age of 18 and above are going to be termed as majors. So anybody who is below the age of 18 is going to be termed as minors. So there are few exceptions to it. There's a couple of ex there are a couple of exceptions to it. So the first one is going to be if suppose if suppose the minor has been assigned a guardian for the person guardian as a person or for his property uh, under the Guardian and Wards Act of 1890, and if suppose there has been a superintendence which means a management by the court of wards for the minor's property in these two cases the majority is going to be attained after after the age of 21 years so what is going to be the court of wards court of wards is nothing but so in case of a legal heir if, if a minor is going to inherit the property as a part of a, is a family property or something, in those cases, in those cases, uh, the court of wards, which is going to be, they will be managing the legal body. The legal court of wards is nothing but a legal body, which will be managing the property which has been inherited by the minor. So in these two cases, in case of a guardian being assigned to the minor, and in case where the uh, court of wards is going to manage the property inherited by the minor, the majority, the age of majority for the minor would be 21 years. Okay, so fundamental rules governing a minor's agreement. Basically, the reason why, why the law has been created exclusively for minors is going to be for the protection of their interest. Because law protects minors against their own inexperience and law also does, does not cause any kind of unnecessary discomfort to the people who are dealing with the minors. Okay, so there are certain positions. So if suppose, if in case a minor enters into a contract, what are the, what are the circumstances and what, are, what is the position of the minor going to be in those situations? We'll be, discuss, we'll be discussing those in detail now. So first, an agreement with or by a minor is void and inoperative ab initio which means it's void from the beginning or it's invalid from the beginning. So say for example, say for example, uh, Mr. Mr. S who is a minor enters into an agreement with Mr. K to, uh, for, for, by mortgaging his house, he has taken a loan for rupees 5,000. Okay, so he enters into an agreement and gets an advance of rupees 500. Subsequently, if Mr. S does not withheld his promise, does not uphold his promise. In those cases, Mr. K cannot go and sue Mr. S because from the beginning, the contract is not valid. So now next, he can be a promisee or a beneficiary. 
he he can receive the benefits that is a minor can receive the benefits it's not like say for example if uh, mr if mr x goes and uh, enters into an agreement with mr y to purchase his bicycle for 500 rupees and subsequently if mr y doesn't perform his promise on the ground of x being a minor it won't be uh, it won't it won't have hold in the court of law it will be the x if x wants to perform x can be a beneficiary if x wants to perform his promise he can perform but y is entitled to perform his promise irrespective of x promise because it was x who has the benefit of uh, claiming the minority next his agreement cannot be ratified by him on attaining the age of majority say for example say for example if mr x who is a minor uh, who is 15 years of age and uh, uh, gets a loan from mr y for 10000 rupees and writes a promissory note in return for that so when a promissory note has been provided it's just a promise that i'll be repaying you money within a stipulated period of time if x fails to repay the money y cannot go and sue mr x because it's void and subsequently after 3 years which is going to be x will be 18 years by that time if x again writes a promissory note in favor of y telling that i'll repay you the money this contract by itself will be termed as void that is he cannot the minor who can minor cannot ratify the agreement because there is no consideration in return for that so in this the past consideration cannot be compensated for this promissory note next if he has received any benefit under a void agreement he cannot be asked to compensate or pay for it so if he had received any kind of a benefit so say for example in the, in our case he had received a benefit of rupees 5000 rupees he cannot be asked to return it because the contract by itself is void but if in that case if in that case if he had not spent the entire 5000 if he had spent only 2000 of the 5000 rupees he should be reimbursing back the 3000 rupees okay so the court makes sure that the plaintiff can mitigate the loss that he had suffered next he can always plead minority so by a minor misrepresenting himself to be a major enters into a contract okay so if he is only 15 years of age and he he misrepresents himself to be 18 years old and enters into a contract subsequently if he is failing to perform his promise the promisee cannot the promisee cannot sue him even if he has committed a misrepresentation so it's the it's the promisee's responsibility to be beware of such acts next there can be no specific performance of the agreements entered into by him as they are void ab initio as mentioned earlier any kind of an agreement which has been entered by a minor is void from the beginning and there can be no uh, the court cannot ask for a specific performance specific performance in the sense performing his promise he, he, the court cannot enforce the enforce the uh, minor to perform his promise next he cannot enter into a contract of partnership so as we all know minors are entitled only for the benefits from the partnership so if a if a, if a partner a minor cannot be entered into a partnership for all the liabilities and losses he cannot be adjudged as insolvent a minor cannot be adjudged as insolvent because no contract or no no legal upholding has been put against him so he is not legally responsible hence insolvency is also not possible in case of a minor he can be an agent however a minor can be an agent that is like he can act on behalf of somebody and that person for whom he is acting will be held responsible in case of non performance of a promise so he can act as an agent that is being an intermediary the principal will be held responsible for all the acts of the minor his parents or guardians are not liable for the contracts entered into by him so uh, guardians or parents cannot be held liable for the performance or non performance of a minor in the contract so it's but then if a minor is acting on behalf of his parents or guardians then the then the rule of principal and agent would be applicable and they can be held responsible 
And last one, a minor is liable in tort. A tort is something like a civil wrong. Say for example, if a minor has entered into an agreement to, to smuggle illegal goods or illegal substances or to commit a crime, an agreement to commit a crime, in those cases, minor is going to be held responsible and he will be sued in the court of law. So, minus liability for necessaries. Necessaries are something like uh, very basic needs. If somebody is providing for the basic needs of a minor, in those cases, minor is responsible for reimbursement through his properties. Minor as such is not going to be held responsible. It will be through his properties that he will be made to reimburse for the necessaries that he had received from the other party. So, necessaries include necessary goods. Necessary goods are like basic food, clothing, shelter, anything that has been provided. Basic can also include like a small bicycle or uh, any kind of an educational books that has been provided. All these things are going to be calculated as a basic needs. So, if suppose a branded clothing is provided or a branded watch is going to be provided, all these comes under luxury. But then only the basic needs if something is going to be provided, and in such cases, the person who has provided these basic necessaries to the minor is entitled for a reimbursement or compensation through the minor's property. Okay, so services rendered, same thing holds good. Any kind of services that has been rendered for the educational upliftment or, or any kind of a skill development or uh, any legal advice, medical advice, any kind of an advice or service is going to be rendered for a minor it's going to be, re, it can be reimbursed through the property of the minor. But minor as such will not be held responsible or liable. It's the way it will be compensated through the properties that are being held by the minor. Loans incurred to obtain necessaries. Same thing holds good for loans as well. Any kind of loan that has been taken by a minor in order to get the basic necessary goods or services will be treated same as the goods or services has been rendered to him directly. So the uh, loans that are being taken are entitled for reimbursement or compensation through uh, the uh, properties that are being held by the minor. So that's with minor. So any kind of a contract that is being entered by a minor, an agreement entered by a minor is going to be void. And these are the situations. And in, in all the cases, it's going to go against the plaintiff and the minor can be a beneficiary of such benefits. Next, next, next person who is going to be incompetent to enter into a contract will be a person with unsound mind. So as the section 12 of Indian Contract Act 1872 states that any person, any person who is not able to understand the terms of the offer and is not able to make any kind of a rational judgment is going to be termed as a person of unsound mind. So any contract that a person accepts, any offer that a person accepts when he is not of a sound mind is going to be vo void ab initio. So if suppose a person is, uh, sometimes he is of sound mind and sometimes he is not of, uh, not of sound mind, that is unsound mind, in those cases, when he is of sound mind, if he enters, in, enters into a contract, that contract is going to be valid. Whereas if he, when he enters into a contract, when he is of unsound mind, in those cases, it's going to be void. So the persons who are being classified as per people with unsound mind are lunatics, idiots and drunken or intoxicated persons. So lunatics are someone who is going to be due to some psychological issues. Due to some psychological issues, they have a partially sane mind and partially insane mind. Sometimes they would be sane, sometimes they would be insane. That is uh, due to some kind of a psychological or mental state, they become that way. So in this case, when they enter into a contract, when they are of sane mind, the contract is going to hold good and he is entitled for the performance of his promise. But then if he enters into a contract when he is of insane mind, the contract is going to be termed as void. And uh, in case of idiots, idiots are someone which is a per permanent in nature. That is, lunatics are temporary people, whereas idiots are going to be like someone who is permanently not, not of sane mind or not of sound mind. So they won't be able to make any kind of rational judgment and any contract that is being entered into by an idiot is going to be void ab initio. 
and drunken or intoxicated person if a person is so drunk that he is not able to understand what the offer is and he accepts and signs an offer in those offer are going to be termed as void and it's not going to hold good in the court of law so these are this is the pe people of unsound mind cannot enter into a contract and if they enter they are going to be it's going to be void next third other persons other persons are going to be alien enemy alien enemy any contract between an enemy country so say for example if mr x belongs to russia and mr y belongs to ukraine before the war break, broke down they entered into a contract to supply certain goods but then subsequently when the war came in when the war came in the contract that has been entered by x and y will be suspended will be suspended and once the war is over the contract can be revived it's upon the both the parties and the position of the countries so in this case any contract with an alien enemy if suppose during the war x and y enters into a contract it's void ab initio the contract will not hold good okay next foreign sovereigns their diplomatic staff and accredited representatives of foreign states like us ambassador to india or indian ambassador to italy so these are the people who will be moving in that country or living in that country in those cases they are entitled to enter into a contract with a person of that country so say for example if a us ambassador to india is here and he is entering into a contract with mr x it is legally possible and it is legally valid contract but then subsequently mr x cannot go and sue the us ambassador to india in our court of law without any kind of a sanction or permission from the central government because for this one contract it could affect the diplomatic relationship between both the countries so in this in this case it would be a central government's decision whether to allow for suing mr us ambassador to india uh, in our court of law or not next corporations corporations are going to be like it will be classified as two companies companies which are going to be registered under companies act of 2013 and statutory corporations so in case of companies which are being registered under companies act of 2013 whatever being the object that has been mentioned in their memorandum of association they cannot deviate or go beyond that so if any kind of a contract that is going to go beyond the uh, list of objects that are being mentioned in the moa is going to turn into ultra vires ultra vires is beyond the power is going to turn ultra vires and it's going to become void same likewise in case of statutory corporation any kind of an agreement which is being entered beyond the stature of the corporation is going to be ultra vires and it's going to be void next insolvents insolvents are those who uh, who have more liabilities than their assets so they are not able they won't be able to repay the loan that they had taken in, in those cases uh, the the court will assign an official assigner or a receiver for the properties of the insolvents so in this case insolvent cannot enter into a contract insolvents cannot sue anybody and insolvent cannot be sued as well so in this case insolvents are incompetent persons to a contract and finally the convicts any convict who is serving a sentence in the in as per the indian penal code is not entitled to enter into a contract once the sentence is completed or if he is on a parole period or if his bail has been provided subsequently after he comes over only he can enter into a contract these are the people these are the other persons who are not eligible to enter into a contract in order to make it as a valid contract and these are the people who are incompetent to enter into a contract final recap uh, persons who are going to be incompetent to contract are going to be minors a person with unsound mind and other persons or disqualified persons by the court of law thank you